Well, good morning. Welcome to Remote Worship here at Johns Creek United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you've joined us. I'm Pastor Charlie Reeve, and it's always a privilege to connect with you in this way. Uh, it's, a, it's exciting. What's also exciting, of course, as some of you may realize, that today, when you're watching this particular service, we're also beginning our first outside worship experience here on the campus of John Street United Methodist Church. And so uh, there may be some of you who are listening or watching who have registered for that already. And so we look forward to uh, seeing you if you're watching this before 10 a.m., which is when the, the service begins. So we're excited about that. It's the first time we've really gotten together in person uh, in a long, long time. So uh, once again, we're uh, thrilled to be able to worship in that way too. But we'll continue to offer remote worship like this uh, continually. So don't worry about that. We'll still offer uh, remote worship if you're not able to be here for outside worship. So let's uh, have a word of prayer. Lord, we do thank you for this time together of worship, to be able to, to come to you in prayer and in praise and realize that you're, well, you are still God, even in the midst of such chaos and difficulty as this uh, COVID time, we know that you're still on the throne. Uh, we know that you're still guiding us and strengthening us and empowering us through uh, these times together. Uh, thank you for this church and its ability to empower us as well as uh, we continue on this journey together. And Lord, now you've given me the amazing privilege and responsibility of preaching your word to these, my friends, and your servants. Uh, a task, Lord, that I cannot do on my own strength or power. I need your strength to do it. So Lord, speak to me and through me in such a way that all of us receive a word from you that will make a difference to our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, today I want to talk with you about something that I think all of us are familiar with, especially during these COVID times, and that is the feeling of being stuck in life. Ever felt that way? You feel helpless and hopeless. You feel like nothing is ever going to change. It's going to be the same thing over and over again. Now, honestly, you feel trapped. I recall being trapped in an elevator some time ago when I was uh, visiting someone in the hospital. And I was, I was in a hurry and this uh, elevator door opened up and it was crowded with people, doctors and nurses. There was a, a guy in there on a gurney. I think he was headed to surgery, but there was room for one more to squeeze in. And since I was in a hurry, I got in. I went into the elevator, the door shut, and it wasn't long before that thing sputtered and stopped. And I was freaking out. The guy on the gurney was freaking out. In fact, he's told the nurses he was claustrophobic and they were, they were trying to calm him down. Well, somebody pushed the emergency bell on the elevator, praying and hoping somebody on the outside would help us. And after about five minutes, about the longest five minutes of my life, that elevator sprang back to life and began to move, and we were so relieved. And I'll tell you, when those doors finally opened, I have never moved so fast in my life. Oh my gosh, and in fact, when I got to the person I was visiting, I felt like saying, could you pray for me? Needless to say, when I left the hospital, I took the stairs. Being trapped is not fun. Being stuck in life is certainly not fun, but, but it happens. I know many of you feel that way right now. You're, you're COVID stuck. There, there's a limited things that you can do right now. You feel like you're stuck at home forever and ever doing the same things over and over and over again and you're thinking to yourself, will I ever get out of this? I just feel so stuck. Or maybe some of you feel stuck in an addiction and you've tried your best to get over a particular addiction or habit but, but nothing you do helps, nothing, nothing you do works. Maybe you feel stuck in your marriage it's been a long time since you've felt any romance at all, and you've tried to bust through it, you've tried uh, not to remain stuck, but, but nothing you do really works. Nothing you do together really works at all, and, and you're afraid that it's gonna continue like this forever and ever and ever. Maybe you feel stuck in bad thinking, or negativity, or a bad attitude. And you catch yourself over and over again trying to get away from that, that bad thinking or bad attitude or bad habit, and you can't seem to push through it. Or maybe you feel stuck in your life goals. 
There was a time earlier in your life when you had dreams of doing something really important or really significant with your life and, and you've made plans and you've made goals and you've tried to do your best, but you're just not making progress and you just feel stuck. Or, or maybe you feel stuck when it comes to your health. Uh, you know, the same health issues over and over again, and if you have to visit a doctor's office one more time, you're just going to scream, stuck. Maybe that's where you are today. Maybe that's how you feel today. You feel like it's never gonna get any better, that it's never gonna change, that you're never gonna be free. You feel like Bill Murray in Groundhog Day, the same day over and over and over again. Well, today I have some great news for you. You don't have to remain stuck in your life. You don't have to remain trapped in your life. You can be set free. You can experience freedom. You can get unstuck if you simply apply the wisdom I'm gonna share with you today. And, and some of you may say, well, Charlie, where do I sign up? How much does it cost? <laughs> I need that wisdom. I, I need that help. I wanna be free. I'm tired of suffering. Well, it won't cost you a dime. It's completely free, and it's some of the oldest wisdom you can ever hear, and all you have to do is apply it, and you'll be set free. And I know people who have applied this wisdom. I have, and I've seen them personally set free. I know people who have applied this particular wisdom I'm gonna share with you today, and it's gotten them to get over bad habits and bad thinking and addictions and bad relationships. In fact, there was a guy in the Bible who applied this very wisdom, and when he did, he experienced a miracle. Now, he didn't realize he was applying this wisdom until he experienced the fruits of it. And I wanna, I wanna speak with you about this person in the Bible just briefly today. We see his story unfold in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And if you wanna turn there, please go ahead. The ninth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, I'll give you a second to, to grab your Bibles or grab your iPad or grab your phone. Ninth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Great story. Now, as you're turning to your Bibles and turning to that chapter, what I wanna do is just kinda of set it up for you. Jesus meets this particular person after he returns from a trip to the mountains. He has gone with Peter, James, and John, uh, what is called the transfiguration. They go up to the mountain to pray, and, and Jesus experiences these visions of Elijah and Moses who confirm that he is the Son of God. And as Jesus is returning down from the mountain filled with wonder and awe, he notices the, his, the rest of his disciples fighting with the religious leaders. And there's a big crowd surrounding them, and they're going back and forth and back and forth, bickering and fighting, fighting and bickering. And Jesus is wondering, what in the heck is going on? He's like, time out. And that's when we pick up the story. Verse 16 of Mark chapter 9. Jesus asked them, what are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it, it dashes him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. So Jesus quickly found out what was going on. This man had this boy of his who was suffering terribly, and he had come for Jesus to heal him, but Jesus wasn't there. And so he, he saw his disciples and said, can you, can you help this guy? Can you help my son? He is suffering so much. And you know what? The disciples thought, well, I, we probably could. Jesus has given us authority to do it. And they tried, and they tried, and they tried, and it didn't work, and the religious leaders were livid. And they said, who gave you the authority to do this? Why did you even attempt to heal this boy? Now you see the disappointment in the father's eyes, and that's when Jesus entered the scene. Verse 19, he answered them, you faithless generation, how much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. So Jesus responds to the situation and to the disciples like this, really, really? How long do I have to put up with you? 
you are testing my patience. I just go away just for a little while to get away for some peace and quiet and to pray, and this is what I have to deal with? Do you have no faith? My gosh, just bring the kid here to me. Verse 20, and they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground, and he began to roll about, foaming at the mouth. Now, when I read this verse, you know what I think about, and maybe you thought about it too, I think of The Exorcist, the movie The Exorcist. You know, Linda Blair, whose head is spinning around, and she's spitting out the split pea soup. That's what I think about. But if you really notice the text and you observe what's going on, you notice that the kid is really having a seizure. But you see, we see that because we have the benefit of modern science and modern medicine. Back then, they didn't know that. And so when they began to see a person having a seizure, they began to use their imagination and think, well, there must be a demon living inside this child. Could you imagine living with that stigma of people thinking you had a demon living inside of you? Here's what happens next. We look at verse 21. Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And the father said, from childhood, that has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. So this particular issue had been going on since he was a kid. And he was probably a teenager, you know, who had suffered from this problem, this malady, uh, since he was a little boy. And his father had watched him suffer from it. His mother had watched him suffer from it. His community had watched this kid suffer. And there was all the gossip, right? Can you imagine a community seeing this kid do this and everybody gossiping about that kid who had that demon and how weird and strange he is. He was made fun of. People were afraid of him. Can you imagine that experience? And they had tried for years and years and years to help this kid. They probably took him to all these different witch doctors. They probably took him to all these different healers and nothing had been done. And, and then, and then they, he hears about Jesus and says, maybe I'll take my son to Jesus so he doesn't suffer anymore. And my gosh, maybe he can help him. But of course, he doesn't find Jesus. He finds his disciples and Jesus is not there. And can you imagine when Jesus finally appears when he's face to face with Jesus, the possible person who can heal his son, can you imagine the desperation in this father? And you hear and you feel this desperation when he says this. If you are able, Jesus, to do anything, have pity on us and help us. And then Jesus responds to him, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. And Jesus was saying, if, if, you're talking to me and saying, if, I can do it. The real word here is you, do you believe? Do you have enough trust in me? Do you have enough faith in me? Because if you do, I can heal this boy. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of you. And I want you to wait for it. When the father hears this, something just erupts inside of him. Something just bubbles up inside of him. All the years of suffering with his son, all the years of, of trying to be patient for healing, something erupts inside of him and listen to his response. He says in verse 24, immediately the father of the child cried out, listen to this, I believe, help my unbelief. He cried out to Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. Now to be honest, this is where most of us live. I believe, semicolon, help my unbelief. Most of us live right on top of that semicolon. 
between belief and unbelief. There are days when we feel certain. There are days when we feel such trust. There are days when we feel such great faith. But then there are days when we don't feel certain at all. There are days when we don't feel trust at all. There are days when we don't feel faith at all. And this man, he came to that moment where he was so honest. He gave this honest confession, but I tell you, it was more than an honest confession. It was a plea, can you help? Can you help? Can you help? You see, he wanted to believe. He asked Jesus to help him believe. He wanted to believe, and so he pleaded to Jesus. He cried to Jesus, so help me believe, and guess what, that was enough. He still had some uncertainty. He still had some doubts. But he had enough faith to cry out to Jesus to help him believe, and that was enough. So watch what happens next. When Jesus saw that a crowd came coming together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. So at that moment when the father just had enough faith to cry out to Jesus, Jesus performs this miracle and he heals this boy. And what's interesting very interesting is just a little later after Jesus heals this boy and we see later in the text that after Jesus healed him it it seemed like the kid was dead but then all of a sudden Jesus picks up the child to his feet and the child is alive and so the disciples are wondering are asking the question and this is key as you might have been asking at the moment if you had been there. They asked Jesus, away from the crowd, Jesus, how come you could heal the boy, but we couldn't? I thought you had given us authority for ministry and for healing, yet yet we could not heal the boy, yet you could. And Jesus says something very interesting. He said to the disciples, This kind can only come out through prayer. That's what he said to the disciples. This can only come out through prayer. Now the question is, what prayer? I didn't see or hear the the crowd praying in this text. I didn't see the, 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 the child praying or crying out in this text. I didn't see the disciples praying in this text. I didn't see Jesus praying in this text. Who was the one that prayed? What prayer is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the prayer of the Father. I believe. Help my unbelief. That was his prayer. Now some of you may be thinking, okay, Charlie, I get it. It's about faith. We need faith. But Charlie, the question is, and I'm stuck right now, and I'm miserable right now, so the question for for you is, how much faith do I need, really? How much trust do I need to get unstuck, to stop being miserable, to be set free, to be whole? How much faith do I really need? And here is the message of today. Here is the message of this passage. Here is the message of this text. How much faith do you need? Just enough faith to take a step. Just enough faith to take a step. You see, that's what the man in the text did. He had just enough faith to take one small step. You see, Jesus today is not asking you to do mental gymnastics. He's not asking you to to totally be free from your doubts and questions. He's not asking that. Jesus is simply asking. 
for you to have just enough faith to take one small step. Martin Luther King Jr. said, faith is taking the first step when you don't see the whole staircase. So the question is, for me and for you, what is that first step? Well, honestly, it's, it's different for different people. For some of you, that first step may be taking your spouse's hand in the living room one day and saying, you know what, honey, I know our marriage is a mess, but I love you and I want this to work. Let's do something about it. Maybe that's the step. Maybe, maybe the first step for you is just getting alone with God in prayer and saying, Lord, I, I, I need your help. I don't go to you often, but, but I, I wanna believe and, and I need your help. Maybe that's the first step. And maybe for some of you, the first step is finally receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and becoming a part of the church and saying, Lord, I don't have all the answers and, and I still have questions and I still have doubts and I, I still have periods of darkness, but I'm finally coming to see that you have the words that lead to life, that, that is your path that leads to life. Maybe for others of you, the first step is finally picking up the phone and calling a counselor and saying, you know what, I just need help from somebody. Maybe for others of you, the first step is finally admitting to yourself, you know what, I have a problem, I have an addiction, and my life has become unmanageable. Maybe for, for others of you, the first step is finally doing some Google research on that dream you have. Just turning on your computer and doing a little research about something you wanna do. Maybe that's the first step. Or maybe the first step for some of you is to finally call the doctor and go see him or her because you have been putting it off and putting it off and putting off. Now, will taking that first step get rid of all your problems? No, but I'll tell you this, it will set in motion a process of faith that will help you get unstuck. And so the question I have for you is what do you have to lose? Now, some of you may remember the, the movie Indiana Jones and the, the Last Crusade, it was the the third installment of that series. I love the whole series, except for maybe the fourth one. That was a little questionable. But The Last Crusade with Sean Connery, who plays uh, Indiana's or Harrison Ford's father, it's a good movie. I really love it. And, and you, some of you may remember that the, the climax of the movie is, is when Indiana is about to obtain the Holy Grail, the very cup of Jesus Christ he's been searching for. But before he can obtain it, you may remember, he has to pass three particular tests. And the first, the first very test he has to pass is called the breath of God. And that first test is he has to walk through a long corridor and he has to kneel and pray just at the right time or a bunch of metal blades will cut off his head. Thankfully, he does that and gets through that first test. The next test is the Word of God. And in that test, you may remember, Indiana has to step on the right stones, spelling out the name of God in Latin, and if he doesn't, he will fall down into a deep chasm to his death. And thankfully, he passes that test. But then finally, the third test is the path of God. And this test, oh, it's a test because on the other side of this deep chasm, which is about 100 feet across and about 1,000 feet down, on the other side is the grail. But he has to cross it. And he looks at this deep chasm, and he, Indiana becomes very afraid, and, and finally his father says, Indiana, you must believe. And so Indiana realizes it's a test of faith of taking one step of faith so he gets to the chasm and he still has doubt, but he has enough faith to take a step. And as he takes that step into the chasm, he feels this invisible force holding him up. Well, church, 
When you have just enough faith to take a step in the name of Jesus, you will find Jesus holding you up. And that step will give you enough faith to take another step, and then another step, and then another step, and then another step, until you are set free. You see, the more you get to know Jesus, the more you will trust Jesus. And the more you trust Jesus, the more steps you will take, the more faith that you will have. You see, the truth is, acting on the faith you have produces more faith. You get that? But you'll never know how much faith you have or the faith you can have until you take that one step. Will you take it? What do you have to lose? Let's pray. <clears throat> oh Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief. Oh, help us just to take a, one small step in your direction. Help us to do that, Lord, so we commit to that. We will, we will do that. Despite some of the unbelief we have, despite of the doubt, despite of the negativity, despite of the uncertainty, especially during these times, we will take one small step of faith in your direction. Whether, whatever that means for us, for some of us today, it is simply saying, Lord, despite all the news and the bad news and the division, I'm going to choose today or for the next minute to trust in you and your good news and to trust you have the last word. Lord, thank you for your power. Thank you for your strength. We put our faith in you. We take a step toward you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a, a closing song, and maybe you'd like to join us where you are. So let's sing together. <clears throat>